Aloha and welcome to our Word of Life radio program here in wonderful Okinawa, Japan. Lord, send your rain. Let's give the Lord a great big hand clap this morning. Amen. Father, we do come before you this morning. We want to thank you for every person here this morning. And I pray that you would make this word that it would be relevant, fit in the context of their lives. Speak to them as only you can. And we pray for all of those that are listening by live stream. We so appreciate, Father God, our extended family, our neighboring islands, and we're thanking you what you're doing in this place. Father God, we say together, Lord, send your rain. Speak to us, Lord, and minister in Jesus' name. And everyone in agreement said, amen. High five your neighbor. Say, you're still looking amazing. I'm loving it. <laughs> in a few weeks, we're going to be starting a, a conference. And it's more than a conference. It's an outpouring for an in-working. Say, outpouring for an in-working. And, uh, and I'm excited about that. I, I believe I've been directed, given where I've been and how I've been ministered to myself, in the last uh, couple of weeks, and I'm excited about this morning, excited about all of you as well. And um, we've been doing a series called Seven Strong, how to build a strong house, meaning a personal life that reflects upon your home life, that reflects upon the, the, the other house that you're supposed to be focused on in called the church of God. The, God's church is called his house. You have a home, but everything begins with your life, this temple, this house of yours. Amen? And so the strength of one becomes the strength of another that becomes the strength of another. And so we've been focusing on what I call seven pillars. Now, the Bible says a wise man will build his house on the seven pillars. And so there are seven things uh, we've begun to talk about. Um, five of them. The fifth one will be today. The first one was uh, what's called the supply. Can you say the supply? We're talking about the power of prayer. You just saw or uh, heard um, uh, Jonathan uh, up here mentioning about how we were praying for the last um, seven days because we believe in the supplier. Amen. Who gives us a supply as we pray in the name of Jesus. Then we talked about, of course, the name of Jesus. We talked about the blood of Jesus. We talked about the vision. I would say the vision, God's vision, and we um, unwrap some things. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the fifth principle, the fifth pillar of building a strong house, a strong temple, a strong life, and that is the spirit. Can you say the spirit, which I mean, what I um, primarily mean is um, uh, the spirit-filled life, uh, living a spirit-filled life. There are many thoughts in about the Holy Spirit led and filled life. And I'm going to break that down for you. Not break it, but break it down for you. Uh, I would like to unpack it for you. And I want to give you some understanding, though, uh, of its foundation and its direction. I mean, there's where do you begin? It's all over the Bible, the insight. But I want you to hear these words. And, and um, our, our conference it was declared by our pastor at the, actually last year, began this year, and, um, and our declaration is, Lord, send your rain. Everyone say, Lord, send your rain. The book of Hosea tells us that the Lord will come to us as rain. And there's a reason for that. I'd like to read that from Hosea chapter 6, um, verse 3. And it says, let us pursue the knowledge. Let everyone read with me. Ready? Read. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like rain, rain, like the latter and the former rain. It would say like the latter and the former rain. You know, there are many properties and benefits and multiple, um, in a multiple way of rain and what it uh, does and, and how it can affect life. But rain brings benefits to every living creature on earth. You know, just biblically, uh, not even biblically, just, just, just in our own simple, unscientific understanding, rain has an effect on things growing, but not only refreshing and nourishing, strengthening, sustaining, and empowering. It certainly rain does. It, it washes away dirt and debris, which can be things like doubt and unbelief, not just literal dust and dirt. And, um, but also, 
it, it awakens, it revives, it makes things come alive. And so what it also does is because it comes alive, it has restoring property. Say restores. So, so rain is a life source. And it's interesting that in the Old Testament, which is symbolic of New Testament living, you hear God refer to himself as the rain because rain comes and gives life. It comes and refreshes. It awakens. It revives. And who on earth does not want to be awakened and revived? Amen. But in that, when rain comes, especially in times of drought and barrenness or feeling empty or, uh, or just dry in life, you know, it produces hope and joy and expectation, if not also encouragement and excitement. There are many various benefits, and I'm sure you can think of many more. But I want you to think of just that rain is a life source. It's a source to your life. You know, I don't know what your, your quantities of waters. I know there are certain um, quantities of water that they recommend you drink. But at the same time, you and I know that we cannot really live a long time without quenching the thirst and, um, or being hydrated. And I also want you to hear, because I began to think about, you know, he's, you know the Bible oftentimes gives us like major hints. And he tells us to ask him that he would send rain, his rain. Lord, send your rain. Say, Lord, send your rain. You know, it's, it's like this in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, I lay before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And then he tells us, therefore, choose life. I mean, he actually tells us what to choose. He doesn't want to. And there's only two answers, you know. Life or death, blessing or cursing. Let me help you just in case you might miss it. Might not. Choose life, you know, choose blessing. Amen? And, and there are times where in the book of Zechariah, in chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. I want you to not only hear terminology, I want you to understand how it fits in the context of your right now. I want you to understand that what I'm going to share with you is absolutely biblical. I'll take you through the passages but I want you to hear what God is saying, not to them, but to you. You need to learn to embrace the Bible as his letter speaking to you. He's not just talking about others. He is speaking to you. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You may have physical ears, but if you're looking up what's on Facebook while I'm preaching, you don't have ears to hear. If you're looking up what the latest picture on Instagram is all about, you don't have ears to hear. You might be here, but you are definitely not here. And I want you to understand for all of you Twitter fans and Facebook Nation, listen up. Because if you don't listen, even though you are present, you won't get what God wanted you to get. But then that's your choice. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I feel the preach coming on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Y'all can't handle me. Anyways, but I want you to understand in the book of Joel chapter 2, we're going to break something down that might be helpful for us to understand this concept of rain and what rain has to do with your life right now, where you're at, and the things that you think God is not interested in, He is very interested in. There is going to be an unveiling, what's called the you factor, how God is interested in you, but we're all yous, Right? To him, he's talking to me. When he talks to us, he's talking to me. He's talking to you individually. But so we see in, in uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 23, we begin there in verse 24 as it goes up. You might want to read this out loud because I know you brought your voices this morning. It says, ready, begin. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. High five your neighbor. Say, this is going to be a good day. The first thing that we begin to see are the benefits of the rain. He gives us a promise of the former rain and the latter rain. Say the former rain and the latter rain. 
Now, there are two ways. Now, what I'm doing, sometimes if you're new to the Bible, what you read, you, you get insights pictorially or symbolically out of the Old Testament of what is a reality in the spiritual in the New Testament. And they work together. They don't work apart. But you live under the new covenant, not under the old. Just had to throw that out there. And the point is this. I want you to see something. And Jesus often would come. And when he would preach, he'd preach or minister or teach in such a way that he would paint a picture because he didn't want people to misunderstand what he was saying. He didn't want them lost in philosophies and theories and words. He wanted them to see. God wants you to see. If you don't see what he's saying, you won't get the picture of where he wants you to go. So in uh, the book of Joel, and as many of you do know, some of you may know, now I don't want to presume anything, that this Joel chapter 2 plays a very important part at the birth of the church in the book of Acts. And we shall get there. We shall get there. But let's begin here. The first thing God wants you to understand is he wants you happy. He says, he says, um, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice. He says, he says, as he has given the former rain faithfully. You have to understand the former rain and the latter rain. But he's talking about how he has been faithful in the former rain. You know, the, the former rain is the rain that um, he has demonstrated his presence in, his power in, and his goodness in. But, I, but I'm, I'm jumping. Then he goes on to say, he says, he will cause, this is his promise, say his promise. He will cause the rain to come down for you. For you. For you. The former rain and the latter rain. Now, the former, Israel, Israel understood things in terms of pictorial, but also spiritual. In natural terms, the Israelites knew that the former rain was referring to the fall rain. And this would be the rain that would fall, that would prepare the soil so they can plant the seed so they can get a harvest. The, the latter rain would be the, what's called the spring rain. And it would moisten the soil once it was planted and once it's grown to bring forth the abundant crop or harvest. They both, they needed the former rain and the latter rain in the course of one year to have the most maximum of life uh, from the harvest fields. If they were going to harvest in abundance, they needed both types of rain. That's, that's natural terms. You know, God also wants you to have a harvest. In spiritual terms, it's very uh, easy to understand. The former rain is the power of the Holy Spirit upon the ministries in the old covenant, especially upon what's called the king, the priest, and the prophet. Very important. Before Jesus came, there was Old Testament power. He says, the former reign, he says, I was faithful to you in the former reign. You know, you see the former reign in power, presence, and productivity of how God would deliver his people, uh, bless his people, prosper his people. For example, a prophet would be Moses. And how you saw the, uh, the, the ten signs and wonders. And that's the former reign. The presence and the power of God. He says, I was faithful to you with the former reign. But I love that he encourages us. He wants us to get a picture. He wants you to remember what he's done. Because he's setting you up for what he's about to do. And I want you to hear this because it's not only the former reign. And now, you know, we, we can go back and look at the Old Testament and we see some signs and wonders that are amazing, you know. And so here he speaks to us and he says that he has given the former reign faithfully and he will come, sorry, he will cause the rain to come down for you. But then he calls it the former reign and the latter reign. The latter rain is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the new covenant. As born-again believers, meaning believers who have received Jesus Christ into their heart, you know, we are considered out of the book of Revelation to be kings and priests. That's why we are called to reign in life through Jesus Christ. That's the way God sees you. It might not be how you see you, but it's how he sees us. It's how he sees his church. But I want you to understand, 
This generation, he's saying there is a generation. And since the resurrection of Jesus, this generation he's referring to has begun to experience even more so today the, the power of the former and the latter reign combined. Say combined. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the former reign and the power, the power of the former reign and the power of the latter reign combined upon you. He's trying to give you a picture of how powerful he is, how out of logic he's speaking to you. He's not asking you to understand. He's asking you to trust him that what you have seen is not anything of what you're going to see because it's not only going to be what was, but it's going to be what is to be. It's called the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know there are people here that come from many different backgrounds with many different understandings. Some of them don't understand a thing I'm saying. Others understand things from a very deep way, and we have different directions of understanding what's called a spirit-filled life. I'm not talking about the club life. I'm talking about in Christ Jesus. Hey, wrong spirit you were thinking of for a moment there. You are not this spirit. Anyways, uh, but uh, bad joke. Anyways, I want you to understand here is the number one. It's a promise. God's reign is a promise of his power in your life. He wants you to understand. He wants you to walk in what's called a supernatural. It is not logical. And it's not about your reason, and it's certainly not about your circumstance. It's what you need to get over your reason. It's what you need to get over your circumstance. It's what you need to walk in authority and in victory in this life in Christ Jesus. Amen? But it's his promise. Combine the former rain and the latter rain. Everyone say, Lord, send your rain. See, the interesting thing is that God wants to pour out his his, his answers to us, but most people don't have enough time to ask him sincerely. They're not thirsty enough for the reign of God. They're quenched in their activities of being busy and of being distracted. They can barely make it to the house of God, let alone have time to get thirsty for the things of God. But God wants you to be thirsty because he wants to quench your thirst in a way that you have no idea of the benefits that will come to you. But he wants to paint a picture of how not only powerful he is, but he wouldn't offer you the power if you didn't need it in your marriage. Oh, I went there. Oh, if you didn't need it in your life. If you didn't need it in your body, you need some kind of power when the doctors give you the prognosis that there's no answer or remedy for your condition. When the doctor says, I'm sorry, ma'am, I know you had this insurance company and you put all this money, but we can't cure you from your disease. That's when you got to look to heaven and remember that his name is Dr. Jesus and he still heals today. He redeems today. He restores today. He does what no man can do. It's not based on logic or reason. Or circumstance or science is just based on the grace and the goodness of God. Can somebody just shout just a little bit here? <clears throat> but I want you to understand that's the promise of his power and that belongs to you. But there's a lot of people that have heard about the power of God and have powerless lives in the church house. That's not right. I said, that's not right. Turn and never say, that is just not right. The second thing he reveals to us is the reign of God brings God's blessing, God's method of blessing you with what he calls it the wheat and your vats will overflow with wine and oil, which is the creativity of God, the insights of God, the witty inventions of God. I mean, the strategies of heaven revealed to men so that man can prosper on this earth beyond your reason and imagination. But that's the second thing. The third thing I want to get to because of time I'm having to rush, as you can tell, because you're listening slower than you should be, is verse 25. So Joel continues. So now we've got two, two insights of what rain can do. And in verse 25, Joel says, soul, goes up on the screen sometime. Okay, put down the donut, hit the button. So, or because of the rain, I repent. I'm sorry. Pastor Kuna is watching right now. Hallelujah. Hi, Pastor Kuna. Thank God she's watching. And it's on the screen. Anyways, uh, 
Everyone read it with me to get me out of my situation. Everybody read. Ready? Read. So I will restore to you the years the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I send among you. Now he's saying this because he's talking to Israel at this time through Joel. It's saying, you know, you've lived your life, you've known about me, but you never regarded me. You knew about me, but you never honored me. You made decisions without me. You did this without me, you did that without me. In fact, you only had me as an idea, but you never had me as your Lord. And so, and, and so what ended up happening is they got themselves in trouble. The word locust is really adversary. It's like the army. The enemy would love to come in and consume you, consume your life, consume your marriage, chew you apart, spit you out, make you a spiritual statistic. And that's how the enemy plays. That's his M.O. And I want you to understand what he's saying here, though. He's saying, so because of the rain, I will restore to you. Say to me, Amen. say to me, Amen. notice what it says, the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, you know, has, uh, and the consuming locust, you know, and the chewing locust, you know, all that they have done. Every attack, we're talking about defeats, we're talking about failures, we're talking about lost opportunity, and we're talking about lost time. There are people in this room that you must understand when we talk about the rain, we're not talking about some theoretical, biblical, fancy word that doesn't have application. There are people in this room that have lost hope that anything could be restored in their life. You know, and God restores lost time, opportunities, people, and lost battles. I want you to realize a restoration process is what the rain. When rain comes, it restores. You know, I can't figure it out. You know, I don't have a green thumb. It's brown. But I mean, many of you know what that means. I'm not a botanist. I don't work with, you know, flowers or vegetables and things like that. I, I tend to um, neglect them, and I forget to water them, and they tend to dry up, and they look really scrawny and ugly when they are around me, just because I'm not that kind of a person. I apologize if you're a plant lover, you know, just give me a weed whacker, and that's my definition, but the point is this. I have seen things that looked, they looked like they were so shriveled up. So, like, just might as well rip that thing out and throw it into the trash and uh, you know, whatever. The ground around it looks dry. The, 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 <laughs> the plant, I guess, that I planted, can you tell, is dry, it's dried up, it's brown. It doesn't even look like there's any hope. And then water gets on it somehow, either by mistake, by me, or, you know, or some sprinkler system or something. And the thing, all of a sudden, it begins to come alive. Because of the root system. And, I, and, and because the root system is still alive. When you put a living seed next to living water, life comes to pass beyond your understanding. Now, again, I'm not breaking this thing down for you the way some of you say, like, you didn't say that right. Well, I know I didn't say it right. It's not the point. The point is, to me, I, sometimes we look at our situation circumstantially or how we feel about them. And it looks like that thing is dried up. That's one too many mistakes. That's one too many losses. That's one too many opportunities passed by. Can't ever get another one. And you have those thoughts going on in your head. And then all of a sudden, you pray this prayer in faith, Lord, send your rain. And he says, you really want it? Yeah, send your rain because I need to be revived. I need to be awakened. I need to come alive. There's something in me that's dry. I know it's dry. You know, I'm living with a mask on, but I'm dead on the inside. I don't have the life that I know I should have. There's something wrong. Send your rain. And you don't necessarily know everything. I didn't know everything. I don't know everything about plants and things like that. But it's amazing what's in the soil. It's amazing what water can do. It's amazing what the rain of God will do because it tends to revive. It tends to restore. Say restore. And sometimes we think that God can't restore you know, and we, that God can't put things together because of how it happened or what happened or how long ago it happened or the hurt 
that came out of what happened. And the list goes on and on and on. And we put too much emphasis on the past. We put too much emphasis on the losses. We put too much emphasis on the mistake. We put too much emphasis on the, on the defeats and battles of life. We put too much emphasis on, on the hurt instead of putting our emphasis on the reign and the restore and the reviver of our life. You know, with God, nothing is impossible. And the thing is, all he needs from you and I, he doesn't need you to tell him how to do his job. He just needs you to trust him so that he can do his job. His job is to do what you can't do, but he won't do for you what you should do. And what you and I should do is trust him so that he can do what you can't do. Did you get that? And I want you to understand that's how God works. And I know he knows that you without him can't put your marriage together. You don't know how to get the love back. You don't know how to get your child back. You don't know how to get, you know, confidence back. You don't know how to get the life back in something that, you know, it started with life, but it's lifeless right now. Well, let God rain on it. That's why you say, Lord, send your rain. You're not just getting uh, biblical or using these words. You're literally asking for God's presence, power of the former rain and the latter rain to come into your life right now. Say right now. Say right now. And it's important that you and I understand that. It doesn't matter how it happened. It doesn't matter where it happened. It doesn't matter. God doesn't think the way you think. You think in terms of time. God doesn't think in terms of time. God is timeless. He's eternal. So don't corner God and say too much time. What matters is God, not time. What matters is God, not your circle. What matters is not the negativity. It's your king. It's your Lord. It's your savior. It's your deliverer. It's your redeemer. Somebody shout just a little bit and get happy in the house because he wants to restore you. That's what rain does. That's what rain does. And see, this is why I understand that, you know, this conference is going to be necessary it is necessary for you it's for your for your family for your life it is not an entertainment factor situation you have to make time or you don't get the time that he wants to give you he will give you the time and the attention but you know the little phrase that we use in some christian circles you know you, you gotta well, I won't go there because you won't understand it. It's a Pentecostal thing. Anyways, the point I'm trying to share with you is simply this. It is you got to make time. See, that's what proves that you're thirsty. Yet when you're thirsty, you show up. You show up because you need him to show out. You show up because you need his presence. And the church has got to get that hunger back. The church has got to get thirsty again. Please don't be satisfied. Please do not be satisfied with anything in your life. As good as it is and as thankful as you are and as appreciative as you might be, be hungry because the hungry and the thirsty will get quenched and will get fed with God's righteousness and with God's power. Please, somebody say, thank you, Jesus. That's why I show up. I show up because I want God to show up. I'll be sitting in the front row and say, God, I need this. And I need a vision for my man. And I need a vision for my life. And I need to get your presence. I want to be revived. I need you. Don't let pride get in your way. Well, I, I just, I don't need anything. Woo, you are prideful and full of it. Did he just say that? Oh, I'll say a lot more if because I, I have the mic. But the point I'm trying to share with you, not trying to be rude. But you don't get your thirst quenched if you won't go for the water bottle. And I want you to understand, you know, God wants you to desire him. And sometimes you start off with a no desire. You don't have that desire. It's not in you. you don't, you're looking for emotions to motivate you. Some of you are waiting on your feelings, and that's a problem. Your feelings have been dominating you all your life. What you got to do is start acting on what God's word. He's given you the answer. He says, pray to me. And ask me this, Lord, send your rain. I mean, I just want to tell you people, just ask me, send your rain. Because you have not, because you ask not, and there is no rain because you haven't asked for rain. But if you ask for rain, I will give you rain. Just ask me, ask me, ask me. Say, Lord, send your rain. <laughs> Say, Lord, send your rain. He wants to send his presence, his power, and his goodness in your life. If you're sitting there thinking, I don't need all of that. Ooh, you're in more need than you realize. See, I want you to understand what you think is not God's def uh, not a definition of what God knows about your life. 
You might think you have yourself figured out. That's the problem. It hasn't worked up to now. Probably not going to work tomorrow. But I want you to realize, let him in and watch what he can do. He can give you joy that you never thought you could have. He can get your happy back. He can give you strength. He can give you an understanding. He can give you vision. Many people wake up every day with no vision, no dream, no desire to live life. They just kind of walking zombies. That's why they're so entertained by the zombies, the movies. Because they see themselves walking zombies. That's all they do. Get shot all day long. Anyways, I think. Okay, I don't know what that had to do with anything. Verse 26 says, it says, and you shall, and we say you. Look at verse 26, you, say you again. See, here's that you factor. In every verse, you have God speaking to us, but speaking to you. Turn your neighbor and say, God speaking to me and to you. Say the you factor. And you shall eat plenty and be satisfied. Some of you just aren't satisfied because you haven't eaten because you think you're not hungry. But I want you to understand right now, some of you are eating junk food. <laughs> you are. You're, you're emotionally eating junk food. Some of you thought I was going to go there with the nutrition thing, huh? But uh, that, that's Alexis. Anyways, um. But some of you are eating junk food and you're really unsatisfied. You're going to places and you're doing things, but you're unsatisfied. But you can't break the habit. But see, some of you can't break, like some of you can't break the sugar habit. You're addicted. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I know some of you are saying, stay out of my poi. I, I get it. But see, it says, you shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, say you, and my people shall never be put to shame. See, I'm here to tell you God wants to nourish you in a way that, see, that's what his word does. His word nourishes you, not to do marriage the way you think it ought to be done, but the way he orchestrated the way it ought to be done, which means when he nourishes you, he gives you his word, which changes you, which changes the situation of your, of your circumstance. But he always begins with you, not with the other person. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He asks us to be humble so that he can pour out his grace. He asks us to change so your spouse would be better. And um, he asks us to make the adjustments. Amen. And so I want you to understand, but this is what God wants to do. He wants to satisfy you. He wants you to be satisfied. He wants you to be complete. He wants you to be biblically and spiritually content. He wants you to be made whole. And that's what God does when he satisfies you. There's a peace about you. There's a fullness about you. And, and some of you ha don't have a song on your lips. Some of you don't have a new song to sing. You know, you don't wake up in the morning. It's more like a dread. I got to go through this again. I got to go through my job. I got to go through life. I got to look at my wife. I got to look at my husband. I got to look at my kids. I got to deal with the dog. You know, whatever it is. I'm here to tell you, God can put a joy which comes out in praise because he takes, he takes the oppression off of you and he puts the gladness on you. You know, Isaiah called it the oil of gladness. And I want you to understand, or the oil of praise. And I want you to understand that God wants to give you your praise back. He wants to give you your shout back. He wants to give you that, you know, when you used to speak confidently and openly with excitement and with expectation. Only God can do that. And God can awaken. That's what rain does. And that's what the prophet is saying here. And so it's important that you and I understand that in verse 26, he wants to satisfy you. Say, God wants to satisfy me. Let me say it this way. God wants you happy. God wants you. So everyone say, God wants me joyful. See, the Bible says in the book of Psalms that he'll pull us out of the miry clay, put our feet upon a rock, and give us a new song to sing. You know, God wants to give you a new song. God wants to give you a new outlook on life. That's what the rain does. It washes away the debris. It washes away the dirt. It washes away the doubt and all the reason, all the negativity, because that's what rain does. Say, God's rain does that for me. And in verse 27, watch, it says, Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put ashamed. This is an awakening to who God is. Now, let me simply say it this way. I have this memory that has never left me. 
And it's a memory of when I was in the, what was it, third grade. It almost left me. But now I was in the third grade. And I, I remember I was with Mrs. Snow. She was an awesome lady. And she had the hardest time. She loved me more than anything else. And uh, I remember she was trying to work with me. She was trying to work with me on this math problem. And for the life of me, I could not get it. This is supposed to make sense. And, um, and I could not get it. And then I remember the moment in the third grade, standing next to Mrs. Snow. She was all frustrated because of me. And uh, I just couldn't get I couldn't say. I don't know whether it was four plus. I don't know what it was. You know, honestly, it wasn't really that difficult. But I remember the moment when the light went on. And all of a sudden, I saw, I got it. I, I understood what she said. And it was a moment that in all my experience and journey of life, of all the things I can remember, and there have been a lot of things that I've experienced, that I remember most. And God has like always kept that with me. In terms of the kind of, it's like that aha moment that you get. That, wow, I get it. I see it. And it's kind of like, where I was, that for 25 years I went to church and mama made me go and I would go. And because uh, I'd get spankings if I didn't. And, um, but I mean, I'd, I'd go and I never got it though. And I thought it was irrelevant. I didn't think it was necessary. It didn't make a lot of sense to where we were living, you know, all dysfunctional, all broken up, busted up, and all that stuff. But, anyways, the point is, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. But it was, it was later that finally I, I did get it. I remember people talking to me that I'm talking to you right now and ministering to you. And I couldn't understand why they were so happy. I was miserable. At least I admitted it. You know? And I thought everybody was faking it. Because that's how cynical I was. Anyways. And so, but then I remember the day where, where the light went on. And I realized, I need to make a decision. I, I can see what you're saying. I just didn't see it before. I can't tell you why, but it's just, you know, and I, I, I would slam the phone down on people. I would reject people. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, I had it all together. And I, well, not all together, but I thought I did. And so, you know, you think you do. And uh, there I was. And the thing is, the light went on. And it was just like that, that third grade experience. I know it sounds so simple and almost irrelevant. Like, really, can you go a little bit deeper? Well, the point is this. It really went on. And when it goes on, something happens on the inside of you. It just, there's a wake up. It's not like, it's not mechanical. It's real. And, and, I, and I want you to understand that's what only the reign of God can do. It's called revelation. It's not just called knowledge. It's not just called information. It's called God breathing on you and opening up. It's like, it's like giving you eyes to see what you've never seen before, but it was in front of your face all the time. It's like learning to, it's like seeing that the love that you can have in your marriage has been there all the time. And it's a change of heart. Remember when, I want to be respectful here, and I know we have a, a, a wide audience, so I'm not being disrespectful, but please listen to this only as an instructional point here. When they approached Jesus, the religious leaders, and he said, you know, they were kind of accusing him and trying to test Jesus. And they said, why does Moses allow the certificate of divorce? And they thought they had him because of the prophet Moses. And he said he honored Moses. Jesus honored Moses. And Jesus responded and says, yes, he did allow the certificate of divorce because of the hardness of your heart. See, the thing is this. When you choose, say, God, I may have a hard heart, but I don't want to have a hard heart. Send your reign and change the hardness of my heart. I may not be able to see what I have in front of me, but I want to see. Send your reign and change the condition of my heart. One thing that Pastor says on my pastor, who's coming here with a new anointing, new mantle, which I'm so excited for. He once said this, and it's left an indelible mark on my life. It's when his ministry and his life changed, and he simply said this, when the Lord removed the veil of limitations from his mind, and he was able to see the veil of limitations. He prayed. He had given up in ministry. He didn't see his future, and he had given up, and he had quit, and he walked away. And he said that when he prayed, the Lord 
removed the veil of limitations from his mind. And I just want you to understand, that's why we need the rain. God, what do you have to wash away? I don't know what you have to wash away in Art Sepulveda's life to make him a better husband, to make him a better pastor, to make him a better person, to make him a better, uh, you know, father, parent, you know. But I want to. I want to see. I don't want my pride holding me where I'm at and saying, I got it. Don't talk to me. Don't deal with me. That's pride. I want to humble myself and say, God, I need you. I may know this. Sometimes we come in with all kinds of experiences about how religion was done in our past, but we have no, nothing of God's present in our now. We want God's presence. Everyone say, Lord, send your rain. Let's all stand to our feet right now. Amen. Good morning. おはようございます。小一 speaking. 小一です。おはようございます。えー、I would like to share with the these topics in Japanese. えー、先週放送させていただいた分に関しては、えー、と本文がとっても長かったので全部、えー、パスタアートのメッセージで終わってしまいましたけども先週は実は「ビジョン」という内容の、えー、3回目の部分でした。そして今週は、えーずっと続けています前私たちの生活を強くする7つの柱っていうような内容で続いてますけれども、えー、今週は霊についてスピリットについて、えー、パスタートの方からメッセージがありましたで、えー、とパスタートは、えー、ずっと雨を例えに出してえー、話をしていましたけれどもその聖書の中には雨の表現が非常に多くてですね、えー、なぜその雨の表現がされているかということも一つ皆さんと共有をしたいんですけれどもこの聖書が書かれたその地域、ま、今のイスラエルを中心としたその地域なんですけれども私たちが住んでいるこの日本とはだいぶ気候も違うんですね。えー、雨季と寒季という2つの季節の中でこの地域の人たちは暮らしています。でその中で、えー、毎年12月頃になると秋の雨という雨が降り始めます。でこれはどんな雨かというと、えー、田畑に実った果実とか、えー、穀物とかをの収穫が終わった土地に潤いを与える雨というふうに言われてます。でその雨は次の種をまくために用意された雨ということです。でこの12月から、えー、徐々に徐々に雨が降ってきてですねで、えー、毎年4月頃に春の雨というのが降りますで春の雨というのは何かというと、えー、穀物とか果実を収穫する前の、えー、時期に降る雨です非常にまとまった量の雨が降るそうなんですけれどもえー、その雨というのはその果実とか穀物が盛大に実を結ぶために降る雨だと言われています。でこれをですね実は聖書の中にもしっかりと記されていて、えー、聖書の中の旧約聖書と言われているところの「新明記
と言われているところがあるんですけれどもここの11章の13節から14節というところに「先の雨後の雨」という表現がされています。で「先の雨」というのは先ほど話した通り「秋の雨」ですね12月頃に降る次の収穫のために土地を潤わされるための雨です。で「後の雨」というのが4月頃に降る春の雨で収穫前に作物が実を結ぶために降る雨ということですね。ですので、えー、私たちがその毎日生きていく中でもやはり春の雨秋の雨特に春の雨がいっぱいあったらいいなって思いませんでしょうか私はとっても思います作物が大きく大きく実る雨がいっぱいいっぱい自分の人生の中に降ったらいいなというふうに思いますまたですね聖書のホゼア書というところがあるんですけれどもそこの六章の三節にはこういうふうに書いてあります私たちは知ろう主を知ることを追い求め主は暁のように確かに現れ大雨のように私たちのところに来後の雨のように血を潤わされるというふうに聖書には記されていますこれはどういう意味かということどういう意味かというとですね私たちがしっかりと神様を知ってその神様から得た知識を与えられたら大雨のごとく収穫前の雨が私たちに注がれて私たちの人生が潤いそして多くの多くの収穫が与えられるということですもし今私たちの人生の中でその毎日の生活が乾いてるななんか物足りないな何か困ったこともいっぱいあるな家庭の中でトラブルもあるな仕事場で友達とうまくいかないな同僚とうまくいかないなって、まあ、人生が乾いている状況があれば私たちは神様からの雨を求めていくことがとってもいいことだと思います。えー、本当に毎日聖書を読む中で私たちが毎日の人生を歩む多くのヒントがこの聖書の中には隠されているんですね。で私たちがそんな毎日ちょっと人生の中で乾いた時期が来たとしたらまた聖書の中にこういうふうに書いてある箇所があります。後の雨の時に主を求めよ。主は稲光を作り、大雨を人々に与え、野の草をすべての人に下さると書いてあります。で、すべての人に下さるっていうところがここはポイントだなっていつも思っています。私は神様を信じているから、まだちょっと。わからないなあって思う人。そういうことではなくて、すべての人にくださるというふうに。私たちの神は聖書の中で。言われています。で。はじめに。共有をさせていただいた通り。後の雨は。最終的に私たちの人生に大きな収穫をもたらす原動力というふうになっていますね。ですのでこの雨をしっかりと求めていかないといけないのかなとも思います。でもう一つですねこのイスラエルの地方では、まあ、先ほど申し上げた通り寒気と雨季が大きくしっかりと分かれて一年の中で二つの季節がありますので。とってもその水というものが貴重なんですねなのでそういう意味でも
私たちが雨を求めるというものとイスラエルの地で住む人たちが雨を求めるというのはちょっと違うんですけれどもひょっとしたら私たちよりも本当にその歓喜の時にイスラエルの人たちが水を求めるというのは切実なものかもしれませんですので私たちの人生の中で本当に乾いてしまってああ収穫が何にもない何にも私の人生には生えてこないって思った時には本当に水が欲しいというふうに思うと思いますでその時にはしっかりと神様どうぞ私の人生の上に雨を与えてください後の雨を与えてくださいというふうに祈ってみてはいかがでしょうかで特にあのー、この雨というのは神様の力が与えられる約束というふうにパスタートも今メッセージの中で言っていましたでこの雨を私たちが受けることで私たちの人生の上でいろいろなものを勝ち取っていけますよということもパスタートはメッセージをしてました。ということは私たちの人生の中に生きる答えをもらえるということになるかと思います。例えば私たちの人生であったりとか結婚生活であったりとか健康の面の中で神様からの祝福が与えられてその力が与えられる約束の一つ印であるとも言えます。そして最終的には神様から私たちにその回復が与えられるということです。で、聖書の中ではこういうふうにも書かれているんですね。神様には不,不可能なことはありませんよ。英語で言うと、nothing is impossible というような言葉で表現をされますけれども、神様に不可能なことはないということです。今、私たちの上に何が起きていても関係ありませんそのいつから起きているという時間的なことも全く関係ありません何年そのことが続いていても関係ありません今の状況に満足していなければどんどんどんどん人生が乾いていってしまいますなので私たちがその雨を求めていけばその最終的に神様は私たちにその満足を与えてくださいます。でその私たちがあこれが欲しいなこれが足りないなこんなんだったらいいなもっと健康になりたいな夫婦生活がもっとうまくいったらいいな家族の中でこの問題が解決したらいいなって思うところに神様は雨を降らしてくださいます。もし私たちの人生を、えー、船だと例えてその毎日の人生が航海海に出るその旅だとしたらその船長はイエス・キリストであるということです。ですのでそのイエス・キリストの船長である方の指示を聞いて毎日を過ごしていくと本当に本当に良きものだけが私たちの人生の中に実っていくということです。で、この朝、イエス・キリストを私たちの人生の中にどのようにしたら迎え入れられるかというところなんですけども、これはまた聖書にあります。聖書のローマ書と呼ばれているところの10章の9節から10節にこのように書かれています。すなわち自分の口でイエスは主であると告白し自分の心で神の死人の中からイエスをよみがえらせたと信じるならあなたは救われるなぜなら人は心に信じて義とされ口で告白して救われるからであるというふうに言われていますですのでこの朝私たちのそれぞれの人生の中にイエス・キリストを必要だと思ったら神を
生ける神を救い主だと心の中で信じて口で告白してください。最後に、えー、次の1週間私たちが大きな大きな収穫をもたらす後の雨を得られるということをお祈りしたいと思います。神様ありがとうございます次の1週間私たちの毎日の生活の上にあなたの後の雨を降らし大きな収穫を与えてくださいますように。Thank you, Jesus.Jesus, please give me later rain on my life on next week. ではまた次の土曜日の朝9時に。お会いできることを楽しみにしています。Thank you listening for us.Thank you. Bye bye.